I now call to order the Society's 2,432nd meeting and the annual President's Lecture in the 149th year since the Society was founded on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of the Spring 2021 Lecture Series of PSW Science. As many of you know, because of COVID-19, the Society is bringing these meetings to you via Zoom from locations all around the globe, rather than our usual home, the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. Tonight is the occasion of the annual President's Lecture. And we honor the event by using the Society's ceremonial gavel. Hewn from the timbers of the White House, used in its rebuilding after it was burned to the ground by the British in the War of 1812. Civilizing in a way that old enemies can become close allies and friends. The wood used to make the gavel was recovered from the White House when it was rebuilt during the administration of Harry S. Truman. This evening's lecture will be about the chemistry of nanoparticles and their use in vaccines, such as those currently being deployed to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Our speaker is Michael Saylor, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Director of the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, and Co-Director of the Institute for Materials Discovery and Design at the University of California, San Diego. I'm Larry Milstein, President and Program Director of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, founded in 1871 as the Philosophical Society of Washington. PSW Science is a 501c3 nonprofit education and science organization whose mission is to provide a forum to exchange scientific ideas, further scientific understanding, and encourage scientific inquiry. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the PSW Science YouTube channel where it will join over 150 other recordings of PSW Science meetings and lectures. We invite you all to explore these presentations and to become a member of the society through the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. Member Ship is a critical foundation of the society. I encourage everyone with an interest in science to become a member. It's easy to do using the join button on the PSW Science website. The society is grateful for the sponsorship of the 2020-2021 lecture series by the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and a donor who asked to remain anonymous. And we are grateful for the sponsor of tonight's lecture, the intellectual property law firm, Millen White Solano of Brannigan. A heartfelt thank you to all our sponsors. Before we turn to the lecture, in keeping with the traditions of the society, we will welcome new members and read the minutes of the previous meeting and a summary of the previous meeting's lecture. I am pleased to announce the following new members have been elected to the society. Jonah Coleman, Chief Innovation Officer at Architectural Arts, interested in particle physics and cosmology, who learned of PSW from PSW's videos on the PSW Science YouTube channel. Glenda Turner, a system engineer with the MITRE Corporation, interested in complex adaptive systems and network sciences, who learned of PSW science from a current member. 
and tonight's speaker, Michael Saylor, who learned a PSW through our invitation to give tonight's lecture, and some of whose interests will be clear in part from tonight's presentation. We welcome them all to membership. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2,431st meeting and the lecture by Kan Kwen Ni. Our lecture on the atom by atom assembly of molecules at ultra cold temperatures is available for everyone without charge on the PSW Science YouTube channel, the PSW Science Vimeo channel, and can be accessed directly from the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. James, the screen is yours. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. On December 18th, 2020, by Zoom video conference broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2,431st meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. The recording secretary then read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Kang Quen Ni, Morris Kahn Associate Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology and Physics at Harvard University. Her lecture was titled, Quantum Chemistry at Ultra Cold Temperatures, Building Single Molecules Atom by Atom. At ultra cold temperatures of microkelvin and below, Scientists using optical tweezers are able to build molecules one atom at a time. Ni nee aims to use this technique to build quantum bits called qubits. Using Bohr's model to explain, Ni nee said the, the signature of quantum mechanics is the discrete energy level of a system. One way to describe the discreteness of the energy level is through wave particle duality and wave superpositioning. Ni nee said molecules are perfect quantum machines, having many degrees of freedom. Molecules may be individually identified by the unique electron orbits of their atoms and by their discrete vibrations. Different imaging techniques may observe different degrees of molecular freedom, giving scientists a variety of means to determine a molecule's structure. Nee then described how atomic clocks work, relying on the stable predictability of molecular vibrations. She then described how laser cooling atoms led to developing quantum control technique by which molecules are cooled and trapped inside a vacuum chamber for probing. This technique will allow scientists to construct designer molecules for quantum computation by which n quantum bits are able to compute in two to the nth dimensions. Because molecules have so many degrees of freedom, the corresponding large variety of internal states allow them to store large volumes of information at ultra cold temperatures. This benefit to quantum computing is in competition with the need for qubits to talk to one another. He proposes to store information in the spin degrees of freedom and to allow qubits to talk to one another through the rotation excitation by way of dipole to dipole interaction. Ni nee has worked to construct molecules specifically designed to achieve this quantum computing dynamic. Ni's nee team uses tweezers made of light to grab single atoms and trap them together into the same tweezer to merge them into a single molecule. While conceptually simple, the process is complex. Under glass, Nee's lab laser cools approximately 1 million atoms to roughly 100 microkelvin. They then use laser beams to polarize and trap an ensemble of atoms in their focus. Lasers then focus to approximately one micron and overlay with the ensemble of ultra cold atoms. In that small volume, pairs of atoms absorb photons from the laser cooling beams and eject themselves until the optical tweezers are grabbing only a single atom. Nee's team uses different color lasers to trap and manipulate different species of atoms. In the proof of concept of experiment, Nee's lab used laser tweezers to combine single atoms of sodium and cesium. They forced the lonely atoms together by cooling through a two-step approach. First, they bound the atoms through a magnetic scattering resonance into Feshbach molecules. Second, they used two-photon transition to remove excess binding energy from the atoms. The resulting molecules lived for several seconds. Increasing the intensity of the optical tweezers reduced molecular lifespan. Nee's lab is now working to upscale their achievement and to control intermolecular communication. The speaker then answered questions from the online viewing audience. After the question and answer period, 
President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.41 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting. Temperature in Washington, D.C., two degrees Celsius. Weather, cloudy. Concurrent viewers of the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 62, and views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 440. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor at correspondingsec at pswscience.org. We now turn to tonight's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Michael Saylor, who is joining us from La Jolla, California. Michael is Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Director of the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, and Co-Director of the Institute for Materials Discovery and Design at the University of California, San Diego. Michael's research focuses on nanotechnology with emphasis on biomaterials, drug delivery, imaging, and sensing applications. He is a widely recognized expert on the chemistry, electrochemistry, and optical properties of nanomaterials, particularly porous silicon-based systems. He's an author on more than 300 research publications, one book, and an inventor on 29 patents. He's founded three companies and served on the scientific advisory boards of six others. Among other honors and awards, he's an elected fellow of the AAAS, the US National Academy of Inventors, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Michael earned a BS at Harvey Mudd College and an MS and a PhD at Northwestern University. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during a question and answer session. Michael, the screen is yours. Hey, thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity guys and, and Larry um, and uh, to share a little bit about uh, what uh, we've been doing here uh, in, in San Diego, having to do with uh, nanomaterials and nanotechnology and nanomedicine in particular. Uh, it's a slide required by my university on disclosures. I'm going to start, uh, Larry pointed out, I'm uh, running a, a center uh, here called the MERSEC that's uh, focused on uh, materials design and discovery. And we have an institute also with that. And it's run by Shirley Mung, who's uh, standing to my left on, in this image you see here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that some of these folks are doing uh, and uh, tie a little bit of that into what, what we do in our lab, particularly uh, on my right here, Nicole Steinmetz and, and John Pekorski will be highlighted. I, I wanted to start basically when you, you have a center that's really focused on designing materials, uh, that means a lot to a lot of different people. Um, for example, Shirley uh, for the Institute uh, is a, a materials uh, scientist really focused on energy technologies. And so I've put up a couple of her uh, dreams that she's uh, uh, highlighted to us over the years and what she's working on in her area and how she focuses her nanotechnology research. Uh, Todd Pascal is one of my colleagues who's uh, a co-lead in, in our center, uh, who's a computational uh, scientist, com computational uh, material scientist. And uh, he's uh, focusing uh, really on uh, trying to understand how you use computation to understand design and, and ma building materials. Uh, you heard the minutes from your last presentation uh, on uh, building molecules from the ad one atom at a time. He does the same thing, but on a computer. Uh, and, and I'm gonna talk about an area to focus on uh, in materials, just on dealing with uh, materials that can either be act, act as uh, sensors or as uh, uh, reagents uh, for uh, treating diseases. And one of my uh, dreams uh, is to try to develop a, a vaccine for the next coronavirus uh, that comes after the one we're dealing with right now. So speaking of the coronavirus, you guys are all familiar with this. I do not work directly on, on coronavirus uh, materials right now, I should point out, and I'm not involved with either of these companies or development of any of these technologies. Uh, but I, I think it's a really good touchstone to, to, to show us how far we've come in, in nanotechnology 
and in particular nanotechnology applied to medicine. Um, these uh, are two uh, technologies or two vaccines that are going to be rolled that are already being rolled out. Are uh, going to be rolled out even more extensively in the next uh, few several months. And uh, and uh, what is maybe not apparent to a lot of people is that these materials, these these vaccines, actually are enabled by nanotechnology. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an insight into how that is done and also the challenges and the problems that we face as scientists and material scientists who are trying to develop uh, these kinds of tools and, uh, and, and treatments. Uh, as you probably know, the, both of the vaccines that I showed in the previous slide use a, uh, a, uh, a, a therapeutic uh, known as uh, mRNA, messenger RNA. It's a very new type of a therapeutic and, and very unique uh, properties and very unique problems associated with uh, delivering it. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, I, I just put up this uh, this uh, uh, tutorial because it kind of caught my attention. And when I uh, gave the title of my talk as uh, the, the the year that nanotechnology saved the world, uh, it sounded a little too broad. But this is really what I was really focusing uh, is uh, uh, this uh, editorial that talked about how the impact that nanotechnology has made on this on the, in this really really important area right now. Uh, and as I alluded to, uh, although they're using uh, RNA as a therapeutic, uh, actually the RNA itself is enabled by a, a nano uh, particle uh, referred to as in these uh, in, in the press clippings anyway as a lipid nanoparticle uh, delivery system. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, you know, uh, another vaccine, and I just pulled. A newspaper a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, the New York Times even is now talking about nanotechnology and nanomedicine and uh, the Novavax vaccine, which is on the verge approved, uh, uh, is also enabled by a nanoparticle and actually even shows up on the New York Times website as a nanoparticle. So uh, maybe you could say that nanotechnology has arised, has, 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 has arrived. Now, I don't want to talk down to you guys, but this is actually one of my inspirations. And so uh, if it doesn't inspire you, that's fine. Uh, maybe it's too simple for you, but it's actually just about simple enough for me that I can understand it. And this is actually my first introduction to nanotechnology. When I was a kid reading uh, the Dr. Seuss books, you may recognize this as a page out of Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat Comes Back. Um, and uh, in this cat in a hat is uh, made some pink stain on the snow that you see in the backfield there. And he's trying to help the little boy clean it up and he needs to develop some friends to, to uh, help him do that. And so he takes his head uh, and uh, there's a cat standing on his head and then that hat, cat has a hat and that cat comes off and so all these cats, cat A, B, C, D through the alphabet. Um, and uh, it didn't really occur to me when I was reading this as a child, but as I went through this with my daughter years later, uh, you know, I was sitting there going, well, so if the cat in the hat's six feet tall, how cat Z? Uh, each cat is one half the size. And as you all know, you can run the math. Uh, I've done it for you here on the screen. Uh, if you start out at six feet for a cat and then cat A is three feet, keep going, you have the cat Z being 27 nanometers. And that is exactly in the area of uh, nanotechnology. It's on the order of the size of the uh, nucleic acids we were talking about ago, and on, on the order of the size of some of the nanoparticles we'll also be talking about. So that's cartoons. Um, here's uh, reality. And, and uh, some of you may know this, many of you may not know this, but what's uh, strikingly amazing to me, nanotechnology has been used to treat patients uh, in the clinic for well over 25, 30 years. Uh, the uh, first approved uh, uh, drug article is shown here, it's called Doxel. Uh, it was a uh, nanoparticle drug that, that incorporated uh, an existing approved drug called doxorubicin. And that doxorubicin is shown here. It's a small molecule drug. It's a good anti-cancer agent. Um, why back in 1995 did the scientists who developed this therapy decide to put this molecule into a nanoparticle? And uh, to that is really in two forms. Uh, first, the drug itself has solubility in water. 
And so they were trying to improve its solubility uh, and putting it into a nanoparticle allowed them to do that. As you can see in the cartoon that's shown on the left of my uh, screen here, uh, pull up my, my pointer, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what you can see here is the, uh, uh, the little red dots in the, in the lower left-hand corner of that uh, cartoon there are uh, uh, meant to indicate uh, the doxorubicin that's crystallized, basically condensed inside this ball of basically zone. Uh, and so one of the issues was solubility, as, our, as I've already mentioned. Uh, the other issue was that uh, doxorubicin as a drug, as a free drug, was being used to treat cancer. And part of the reason that the, the researchers chose to use this drug in their nanoparticle formulation was that it actually had problems. Uh, it had many side effects associated with uh, the, the uh, high toxicity of the drug. Of course, it's an anti-cancer drug, so it should be killing things and it kills tumors, but unfortunately it also has side effects. It's toxic to other tissues as well. In particular, a heart, a heart muscle was a problem with doxorubicin. So why would you use a, a nanoparticle to do that? And so I'll just kind of give you a cartoon or uh, kind of a, a animation of, of, of the concept here. Basically, if you were to take that free drug doxorubicin, uh, the patient on the left here, uh, would be injected with that drug. It would basically diffuse into the bloodstream and, and uh, then circulate throughout the body. And the concept of using a nanoparticle is that it allows that drug to more specifically focus and concentrate itself and not diffuse throughout the body, but focus really just on the tumor. And so you might ask the question, well, how does it do that? And the reason that they chose uh, to treat this cancerous disease was a, a phenomenon that was known already back in 1995, at least in animals, they knew that if they injected small particles, nanoparticles, um, into the blood circulation of an animal that contained a tumor, um, that uh, tumor would accumulate the nanoparticles. That's for some reason the nanoparticles would, would tend to just accumulate uh, in that tumor relative to other tissues like the brain. Uh, and you can see here, in this image, it's a mouse uh, on a light table and the, the, the light patches that you're seeing there uh, are highlighted here, the liver, uh, and that's a tumor that was implanted roughly about here in the animal, you can see me on the screen. Um, and uh, the, 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 the green glow there, this is a, uh, basically an intensity map. And so the green intensity you see there is a, a concentration, a high concentration of the nanoparticles. You can see them also draining into the lymphatics here a little bit and then eventually going into the liver. But most importantly, and this uh, for the context of what I'm talking about right now, is, is the fact that this, these nanoparticles will actually accumulate in the tumor. Now, uh, this is referred to as the EPR effect. It stands uh, enhanced permeability and retention. Uh, and in this uh, diagram I'm showing uh, on this chart, you can see um, the nanoparticles are just highlighted, these little red spiky. Uh, they're they're uh, circulating through the bloodstream, and we're, I'm showing here some uh, the the lumen, the, the the walls of the blood vessels, as these nanoparticles are screaming by. Uh, and uh, the feature of tumors that the researchers were trying to capitalize on was that because tumors grow so quickly in the body, they recruit blood vessels in a very haphazard fashion, and so these blood vessels grow very fast, and they grow very irregularly, and so they're very leaky. There's gaps between the cell walls uh, in the blood vessels that feed tumors. That's not seen in normal healthy blood vessels. And so that was kind of the key. Uh, and these nanoparticles then will leak through those gaps and be retained in the tumor, which is highlighted here as a kind of a, a light uh, tan on my screen. The ER effect was what they really wanted to, to cap on. Put the drug inside the nanoparticle so you can get its solubility up and then uh, circulate it through the bloodstream in a nanoparticle so that it will selectively accumulate in that tumor and not anywhere in the body. So uh, it was a very successful uh, phenomenon. And, and again, now we look forward to today when we're looking at the design of the nanomaterials that people are using uh, to treat COVID, um, they're using lipid type uh, molecules and lipid type constructs. Uh, and just to kind of summarize that, when, in the case of Doxyl, and it's really true for a lot of nanomedical drugs now, 
is you're basically trying to improve the efficacy of an existing drug. The really unusual thing about uh, the coronavirus vaccines is they're using molecules that really hadn't been used before uh, vaccines, or they had been tested, but not really been very effective. And placing them in a nanoparticle allowed them to be much more effective. We'll talk about uh, that uh, aspect of it here in a minute. But let's just back up for a second and talk again about the doxel. And so the, what we mean by rescuing failed drugs is doxel was, doxorubicin itself was toxic and not, it, it worked, it was used for, to treat patients, but the nanoparticle made it much more effective. And really what uh, we're gonna see today is, is now um, these small molecule drugs are one thing, but what people are moving to now more and more in the, in the medical community are what we call biologics. Uh, things like mRNA, which is the messenger RNA that's being used in the coronavirus vaccines, uh, siRNA, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that because that's something we focus our research on, and uh, also protein-based uh, uh, molecules. Um, and that protection part is really important there because the molecule doxorubicin is quite a stable molecule. It would stay until your liver clears it out. Um, but it's a pretty stable molecule. Your body doesn't have a good way of killing it or destroying it too much. In fact, that's why it's such an effective therapeutic. Uh, but contrasting with biologic therapeutics, like things that are derived from nucleic acids or proteins, the body doesn't like those things being in there, especially if they're foreign objects, and they'll degrade. These, these molecules tend to be much less stable than so-called small molecule drugs that were so successfully in doxel. And so, uh, we kind of just highlighted a couple of key features that we focus on first, that they can selectively target specific tissues. Um, in the case of uh, a uh, cancer, anti-cancer drugs, we're, they really focused on, uh, on treating tumors. Um, but more particularly, they can find their way into specific compartments within those tissues, specific cells and specific cell types. And that's really a mark of how advanced this technology has come in the last 30 years or so to be able to take a nanoparticle now and, and not just take advantage of this leaky vasculature problem that, that was so prevalent in tumors, but going after other diseases that don't have that same type of feature and using nanoparticles to treat them. And in part, one of the challenges with, with nanomedicine in the early days uh, was you treated things like cancer with nanoparticles because, you know, for instance, doxel was an anti-cancer therapeutic. Why? Because plan B is the patient dies. Uh, you have uh, very deadly, you're, you're trying to do anything you can to, to treat that patient. And so in those early days, even though safety wasn't really well established, people, you know, were willing to take that risk. The, the benefit uh, made that risk tremendously. Uh, you fast forward to today, and now we're more comfortable with working with these liposome type uh, structures and, and different types of nanoparticles and, and, um, and their compatibility with molecules and their ability to treat. And now people are starting to move nanotechnology into diseases that aren't so dire. Coronavirus, where your patients survive even without being treated. Um, and if they do survive or do, uh, you know, do benefit from your therapeutic, you're hoping that they're gonna live for another 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, not like uh, cancer therapeutics by that patient six months, it was considered a success. So it's a different problem now and we have to get more sophisticated in the challenges of how we uh, deal with uh, the treatment of these systems. So uh, again, back to the, uh, the, the, the kind of modern day, the, the, the coronavirus vaccines, they're uh, lipid nanoparticle type systems. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, John and, and Nicole uh, uh, earlier in my talk today. These are my colleagues here at UC San Diego. And um, they uh, uh, just recently wrote, this is a really nice review article, uh, just came out in Nature Nanotechnology uh, late last year, uh, which kind of highlights some of the things that I've been talking about relative to trying to use nanoparticles to now to treat uh, vaccines. And one of the images you'll find in that paper uh, just kind of highlights the types of nanoparticles that people are using. And typically today, we still, especially if we're starting to think about treating a disease, it's going to go into a lot of patients, and it's not necessarily a, you know, a, 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 a deadly disease that where the patient's going to die immediately if we don't treat them. Um, we have to use very safe. Uh, systems. We have to use systems that we know and we're comfortable with using that we have our 20 years of experience. And so you can see here the, 
the liposomes that I just talked about for the doxel, uh, shown in this image, uh, a little kind of the, the blue there is the uh, kind of the greasy uh, part of the, the, the soapy molecule that's used to make the liposome. Basically, you think about these things like little soap bubble, and the interior of the soap bubble is water uh, that contains your drug or the solid drug in the case of the doxel therapeutic, the doxorubicin would be contained in that little yellow pocket. Uh, the uh, coronavirus vaccine type drugs typically are using things that are called lipid nanoparticles, a of the liposomes, but they're a little bit more solid uh, and a little bit different in their design. Uh, and again, kind of you look at what those therapeutics uh, are doing right now is, is a, there's a cartoon here that's called RNA vaccine. Again, that's the, uh, the Moderna uh, and the, uh, roughly speaking, the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines look something like this. They have a RNA, uh, messenger RNA embedded inside the nanoparticle and it's coated uh, with some sort of a lipid type of a outer. So what are the challenges and problems we have with using any kind of a nanoparticle to deliver a nucleic acid therapeutic? Now here, the difference there's, there's a big difference in between nucleic acid therapeutics and small molecule drugs. I already mentioned one, they're not stable. Uh, small molecule drugs are quite stable. Nucleic acids get degraded by the body very quickly. Um, they're also really soluble. So at least you don't have that problem of the low solubility. You can put them into water and dissolve them up to really high concentrations, relatively speaking, for their potency. Um, it's really hard to get them to concentrate uh, in small particles. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, you want to protect that nucleic acid, keep it from degrading, and you actually want to target the right cells. And in particular, and one of the things that we work on a lot in our lab is not just getting it to stick to the cell, but actually getting it to fuse with the cell and deliver that payload directly into the cell. That's critically important for any kind of a therapeutic as well as for a vaccine. You have to penetrate into the cell to get that. Uh, now I'm using in this example an siRNA in the case of the Moderna uh, and Pfizer vaccines, those are messenger RNA, uh, for that RNA to do its thing in, in the case of mRNA to generate a protein that induces the immune response in the body, uh, you need to get that uh, molecule, that RNA in the right place in the right, at the right time. So, um, okay, bear with me a little bit more. I'm, I'm a, a big science fiction fan and uh, this is also one of my uh, uh, one of my passions as a small child and, and reading science fiction novels. Uh, those of you who've heard about Isaac Asimov or read some of his books, uh, uh, you'll appreciate this. If you haven't, just please bear with me. Um, so Isaac Asimov wrote these novels, a series of novels back in the 40s uh, called the iRobot series, uh, cover is shown on the right here. Um, and uh, even back then he realized he's gonna be able to make machines that can act uh, autonomously. Uh, and uh, those probably are going to have to have some design rules to things. And so in Asimov's books, he actually wrote what he called the three laws of robotics. Um, and they're, they're highlighted here. So, um, you yeah, know, the first one was a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. So basically, robots uh, are supposed to be good guys, not bad guys. Um, and being good guys, they have to obey your orders, do what you tell them to do, uh, as long as if you, you don't tell them to kill somebody else. Uh, so they have to obey the first law. And the third law was then the robot, okay, all, all the things, oh, don't just jump off a cliff if you don't have to, you know, so protect your own existence. Um, and so I've kind of reconfigured these laws as my, what I call the laws of nanorobotics. And we are making small machines that can be thought of as that are swimming around in the body and trying to do something interesting and, and follow uh, orders. And so first off, when we're designing a nanoparticle to go into the body, we have to have that same law, first law is that it should be safe. And so in the terms of nanomedicine, that means it should not be toxic or otherwise harmful to the human beings. And uh, the second uh, law then is pretty much follow Asimov's second law. And that's that you know it must follow its programming and so what do I mean by program? It's easy to think about what programming is. It's lines of code. Um, to a chemist, to myself, a material scientist, I don't draw, write lines of code. I write my lines of code in molecules. Uh, and so the programming is done with chemistry. And then third law is actually a deviation 
quite dramatically from Asimov's third law. His third law said the robot should protect itself. In the real world of nanotechnology and nanomedicine in particular, you want that robot to go away once it's done its job. So once it's killed the tumor or it's delivered the vaccine or done whatever it needs to do in the body, you want it to dissolve away. You don't want it being there 20 years uh, still floating around in the patient's body. So it has to self-destruct after performing its function. And you'll see that theme throughout all medicine today. Most of the materials that are being developed and all of the ones that have been approved for use in humans have the self-destruct capability. They get either destroyed or excreted by the body. Okay, so I wanna take you into my lab. I'm actually standing in my building right now and, and just, we went down the hall, you'd see uh, this reaction in real time if my students were there. Um, and this is a video playing of how we make our nanomaterials. We make nanomaterials out of silicon and I'll explain why we're doing that in a minute, but I just wanna show you the experiment, talk a little bit about what we do with them. We start our experiments every day with silicon wafers and we make silicon based nanomaterials by this electrochemical etching process. And uh, as this movie is gonna play uh, again in a loop here in a second, uh, you can see the first place we start, we put our wafers into a little Teflon based etching cell. We fill that cell with hydrofluoric acid. We run electric current through it. That electric current machines out very, very small channels, nanometer scale pores in the materials, which is why we call it porous silicon. And that brown uh, powder there that you see those films there are the porous layers that have been pulled off the wafer, broken up in an ultrasonic bath and made into small uh, nanoparticles. And the zoom here is just to show you that even though they look like big chunks of particle, if you get in really close to them, you'll see these uh, the, the pore size in here is very, very small. So these are basically nanoscales that can hold uh, molecules or other payloads. Uh, and a, a TEM image, a transmission electron microscope image is here shown on the, on the bottom left uh, in the image, just shows kind of what we're done, what we have when we're done making our nanoparticles. Uh, it's made out of silicon. So it's, a, it's basically a silicon skeleton. Skeleton, skeleton has been removed and the electrochemical e equation is shown up here. Uh, we can go into details on that if you like later. So the next question you might ask is why care about why would I want to make a nanoparticle out of silicon? Um, and it's not because we're trying to make little computer chips to go take over people's brains. We are using the silicon for one very important reason. And it's kind of shown here. Uh, and what I'm showing in this chart here is basically the top 15 elements by mass on the side is in the Earth's crust. And on the right here is in the human body. Uh, and there's a lot of elements that you're all familiar with. Of course, we're mostly oxygen and a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen. Uh, and as you go down the list here towards the bottom, you'll see that actually there's a reasonable amount of silicon in your body. And in fact, the calculations and what I think the mass is of a chip inside an iPhone 10, um, most people, if you're 80 kilograms in mass, you're walking around with more silicon in your body than you have in your cell phone, okay? in terms of the little chip in the, in the cell phone. And uh, of course, it's not in the form of a silicon chip. It's in a very different chemical form, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you look kind of at the Earth's crust, there's sort of a map. Um, you know, of course, in the Earth's crust, silicon is number two in terms of percent abundance. So there's a lot of silicon in the Earth's crust. And in fact, that's part of the reason that you see it in the body. What I've highlighted now in the, in the build on this slide is, uh, basically the uh, elements that are not considered essential. Other word, in other words, for mammalian life, for mammals and including us, these are elements that we don't need to live. If you delete them from our diet, we will survive and thrive just fine. Um, and you'll see silicon, aluminum, and titanium are the, only the three in the Earth's crust that really we can't do, we, that we can do without. Um, and so in terms of what's in the human body, of course, silicon, again, is, is, is non-essential. So then the question is like there. And part of the reason that we have silicon in our bodies, I should stress, it's, it's, there's no known use for silicon in the body. There's no enzymes in the body that run on silicon, at least not in humans and not in mammalian systems. As far as we know, uh, it, has, it may have some importance in early uh, bone formation. It does operate it into bone uh, more effectively than, than, than in skin or in other tissues. 
Um, but as far as we know, right, silicon is not an essential element. And the only reason it's on that list of the top 15 elements in our body is probably because it's number two in the Earth's crust. And so we eat a lot of this stuff. Um, and so uh, I've just kind of highlighted here, the Western di diet tends to take in a lot less of the root vegetables and grains that are very rich in silicon. Uh, the Asian diet tends to have more of those and, and rice in particular has a lot of uh, silicon in it. So the Asian diet um, pulls in uh, quite a bit more silicon in their daily, your daily intake um, than in, um, in the Western diet. But even the Western diet, we actually eat more silicon in our diet daily than iron. And of course, we all know how important iron is. In, it's the, the carrier for our blood. It runs a lot of the enzymes that we need uh, to survive and to maintain foods. And uh, it, without iron, we would die. But silicon and iron basically are about the same in terms of our intake. And so the beauty of silicon in, in one sense is it's a material that you can eat and your body takes in all the time, but your body knows how to get rid of it. And in fact, your body doesn't care if the concentration goes up or down to because the body just deals with it and is able to get rid of it. Um, you know, on the left, I've showed just one highlight here since this is an evening lecture. You'll be happy to know that one liter of beer will give you your daily allotment of, of silicon uh, in your diet. And I should, it's really, I'm not telling you guys to go out and eat silicon or supplement your diet in any way because we eat plenty of silicon. And since it's not essential, um, and this is a guidance that's been given by the FDA and, and by the, um, the National Academy that, you know, although silicon has been, not been shown to cause any adverse effects in humans, there's really no justification for adding any kind of silicon to our supplements. And that's because it doesn't seem to have any benefit or, or detriment. And so, Really, the reason you might want to think about using this as a drug delivery vehicle is because the body sees a lot of it already and it knows how to handle it. It's an inert material that the body was not going to generate, uh, you, know, you know, potentially not generate as many problems with it as you might consider for other elements. Oh, what I'm showing on this slide are um, uh, an image that's really a classic one in, in my field uh, in silicon nanotechnology field. Uh, this, these uh, pictures here are taken of a porous silicon, these, the silicon nano showed you in the movie a few minutes ago, um, taking the silicon, uh, etching it out electrochemically and making it porous. And uh, the, the image here on the top says zero weeks. That was actually a, a, a silicon small piece of the chip that was embedded in the back. Of the body. And they watched this material sit in the body for 12 weeks. And, and the amazing thing about the nanostructure that they discovered in this paper and why it was such an important paper back you know, 30 years ago, is um, most people thought, and at the time it was pretty well understood that if you put a silicon wafer, elemental silicon into the body, um, it will just get in scar tissue. It, it, it won't dissolve. But what these guys did is they took this silicon nanostructure plunge that I talked about a few minutes ago, and they found that when it's in its finely divided form like that, it will dissolve. And, and the chemistry has shown uh, um, silicon will oxidize spontaneously or in air to make silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide is readily dissolved in water to make uh, what we call orthosilicate or silicic acid, uh, silicon with OH taken four times. Um, that's a naturally uh, occurring form. Of, that's the form that we have in our blood plasma and, and issues right now, this SiOH4. And so what was really you know, innovative and, and amazing about this. It's, it showed that, wow, you can actually get silicon to dissolve in the body. Um, and it'll go into the, the components that, it, that the body knows uh, what, what it's looking for and, and how to see it. So let's, let's pivot back to, we, we talked a little bit about a nano uh, particle carrier and uh, you'll see where I'm going here in a minute. So one of the challenges that we all have when we're thinking about using nucleic acids as therapeutics, like in the, in the Moderna vaccine or the, the, the Pfizer vaccine, and a lot of these mRNA vaccines, these nucleic acid type vaccines, there's some base as, uh, as you'll see in, in, um, in Nicole's uh, 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 review paper, uh, some based on RNA and other things. Um, we're gonna focus on RNA today, but um, both DNA and RNA, RNA have this problem is that unlike the doxorubicin, which is pretty much a neutral molecule, 
um, these nucleic acids are really highly charged. And I show that just an image here, a picture of the uh, of, you know, one of our uh, sequences in, a, in an RNA, the, the, the fundamental um, you know, repeat unit here, fundamental backbone of the phosphate backbone, that phosphate carries a negative charge. And so the highly negatively charged um, molecule when you make that strand of RNA. And so it's very soluble, um, but it's also then a challenge because it's so highly charged, it doesn't like to pack together. And so one of the big challenges we have in the nanomedicine world is how do I get that material into uh, my nanoparticle? Because they, those molecules don't want to get packed close together. They repel each other because they're negatively charged. And so how do we deal with And I can't tell you what they're doing in the in, in, uh, proprietary vaccines like Moderna or Pfizer, but I can tell you one of the tricks that we typically play in this, in this game is you just balance that charge. And so um, I've been talking about lipids and, and liposomes uh, throughout my presentation today without showing you the, the heart and soul of a lipid, uh, which is, or a liposome, which is the lipid. Uh, a big greasy uh, tail here. Uh, this is one example. There's many, many different type forms. I'm showing just the one uh, uh, DOTAP, uh, as we call it, the abbreviation for this uh, molecule. And the key point of this is it's got a head group there that makes it form the micelle or the liposome. Uh, it's very highly charged. It has a good affinity for water, but it's also got this ammonium group here. And so some lipids are what we call cationic lipids. They have these positive charges that allow them to ion pair very effectively with nucleic acids. And then that, that allows you to pack them more tightly into a nanoparticle. So the trick is to pair off the ions. Okay, so, um, just to kind of get you a, a, where we are in this field now, typically when people loading a, a therapeutic, like a, a nucleic acid, um, so that I'm using siRNA uh, as an example. This is a small interfering RNA um, relative of mRNA, but quite a bit smaller. Um, but typically the same kind of uh, result you'd see is a, a lipid-based nanoparticle or these polymer nanoparticles are kind of shown over here on the left. Um, okay, this cationic charge can go far and even still dismally poor how little amount of that nucleic acid you can actually, actually pack into a given nanoparticle. And so that's one of our challenges. How do we beef, beef up that concentration of our nucleic acid and pack it? And in fact, you know, nature's figured out how to do this. Um, uh, this is a, from 1973, if you can read the, the um, and actually just an, uh, an aside to those of you guys who ever wanna do this kind of uh, research when you're writing your papers, don't ever put the word new into your paper because 50 years later, somebody's gonna come along and say, that's not new. Okay, <laughs> that's a joke. Okay, anyway, the point is, uh, and the beauty of this paper uh, that's shown in this paper is what they were trying to do is trying to understand how they could pack DNA um, and get it delivered as uh, in, in, in these early days and just basically trying to get it to, to, to get it into cells and to see if they could use the DNA to, 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 to the early days of, of basically genetic modification of cell. And the trick that is now a very established, really a classic um, protocol now is uh, you just squirt in a bunch of calcium and some phosphate. So calcium chloride, calcium ion, um, and phosphate along with uh, your, and the calcium and the phosphate will precipitate and make this solid calcium phosphate, very low solubility uh, compound. And so basically it just precipitates a small nanoparticle. At this time, they just call them uh, particles because back in 1973, uh, it wasn't so popular to use the nano word. In fact, it wasn't really being uh, pushed around much back then. Um, so, but they were making nanoparticles or micron scale particles. Some of these were fairly large. Um, basically a precipitate using this kind of calcium phosphate chemistry. Okay, so why do I tell you that? Well, silicon has its relatives in the phosphate world and it's called silicate. Um, and uh, just to kind of back off a second and talk about how you might use a silicon chemistry to be able to do the same kind of concentration chemistry that people use with calcium phosphate comes from concrete, from Portland cement. Um, I, I use this uh, chart uh, in my lectures to my inorganic chemistry class, so bear with me. Uh, all you need to know are two, the, your two ingredients that are the most important. 
uh, in making cement, calcium oxide, and silicon dioxide, sand. When they get together, uh, uh, and they usually put alumina in there too, but you don't need to do that. Mainly the silicon dioxide and the calcium oxide. Uh, you put those two together, you get them wet, they will set up after a while and make calcium silicate. So the glue that holds Portland cement together is the same kind of precipitate with calcium phosphate that I showed on the last slide, but you're replacing the silicate for the phosphate. And so what this, what's been used to pack uh, DNA into small places and RNA into small places is basically ion pairing uh, with the calcium. Uh, similarly, you can pack uh, structures together with silicate and that's how we make uh, the sidewalks that we walk. By. So why am I telling you that? We actually were thinking about this when we were thinking about how are we gonna get our nucleic acid to pack into our nanoparticles in a really high efficient fashion. Um, and so a um, little bit of chemistry there. Uh, so the silicon nanoparticles that we make, as I mentioned, their, their core is they oxidize fairly easily in water to this SiO2, silicon dioxide. And then in the presence of the nucleic acid, this highly negatively charged molecule that normally doesn't want to pack into, the, into those pores, we tried to do the same condenser chemistry that had been played with uh, for decades. Uh, so we just added some calcium chloride to the solution. And lo and behold, the calcium ion, you know, ion paired with the nucleic acid, it helped it pack into the particles to a very high concentration because those negatively charged strands were not repelling each other as much. And then we've got a kind of a benefit that the silicon, as it dissolved local into this uh, silicic acid, the SiO2 started to dissolve, it immediately precipitated with the calcium. And basically we cemented our nucleic acid into the pores with this concrete chemistry. And what was really amazing about this, this is something that happened just a few years ago now in our lab, is that the, the amount of loading of the nucleic acid that we could get was much better than what had been seen previously with these lipid nanoparticles or these uh, silica structures. And so that was really formative for us. So we had a, a way of loading a really high amount of nucleic acid into a particle. Of course, the more drug you put into a particle, the more potent it possibly can be. And so that's a really important factor and an important problem that we work with and, and generally us here in the, in the nanomedicine community. All right, so um, now uh, you see, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures of what these things really look like. So I've shown a lot of cartoons, not a whole lot of real data. Um, so on the left here, these are the, what the, the nanoparticles, our little silicon nanoparticles look like um, when we start before we load a, a drug in them. If we just throw them into a calcium chloride solution in the right uh, pH, uh, you can see these little holes there, the, the sponge, spongy pores that we see in our original particles seem to go away. And in fact, that is the case. Um, the pores get sealed up, um, but they don't change size. They don't turn into a, a concrete sidewalk. Uh, it just cements locally because the silicon is just local to the nanoparticle. So the chemistry really focuses just on the nanoparticle. Uh, and so here's an example on the far right of, of the same basic chemistry, but now nucleic acid, siRNA, uh, and you see we still get the same basic type of nanoparticle, but now it's glued in. And when we analyze these things, we can see again about a 20% by mass loading of the nucleic acid here inside our nanoparticles. So it really worked well. Uh, another question you might ask is, well, okay, if you're making concrete out of this stuff, like sidewalks don't dissolve in water very fast. Um, and again, it, nanostructure. We were kind of surprised, very disappointed, in fact. <laughs> we figured these things would be pretty stable. Um, when you put these things into water, and it's shown in this little the black dots here, put them into a buffer solution that's got the right pH for uh, uh, you know, human, human body pH. Um, within an hour or two, they're just completely. So that was good in a way. Our particles do what we want them to do. They self-destruct, they dissolve, and they release their nucleic acid payload. But, you know, we, we kind of like them to actually stick around for a little while because we want to inject them and have them deliver a drug some. And so this was a problem. We, we, these things dissolved actually too fast for it. Uh, and so, you know, then going kind of back to all the lessons we've learned about lipids and, and, and how they can stabilize materials, we made these sort of a solid lipid nanoparticles where we made the core with our silicon that concentrated nucleic acid, but then we just wrapped the outside of it with one of those lipids. 
Uh, and so when we did that, and you can see the data here on the right, the green uh, and the, the red dots, there's one that we call a fusogenic nanoparticle, which I'll talk about in a minute, and one that's a kind of a control nanoparticle. Both the red and the green dots are, uh, have this lipid coating around them. And uh, you can see um, that basically, what is it telling you? When you wax your car, your car doesn't rust. Uh, so if we wrap our, you know, our, uh, a liposome around this nanoparticle, it slows down its rate of dissolution. Particle, and inside that nanoparticle, the nucleic acid is being protected. So that nucleic acid stays intact, doesn't fall apart, and doesn't dissolve out into solution for quite some time if we wrap that uh, lipid coating around the nanoparticle. And, you know, we're talking about something that's giving out a little bit of, you know, Kind of giving up the ghost within about 24 hours is just about right for us. We want to be able to do these things and have them then dissolve, uh, you know, in the body within on the order of, you know, maybe a few hours to uh, a couple days at most. So this was great. Um, now I have to talk about what I meant by fusogenic. Uh, and I, I'm not going to try to get too far into the weeds here, but I hope you're trying to an, an appreciation at least of, of, of all the, the problems and challenges we have in the, in the nano world. Um, it, it's often not just some simple quick solution. Okay, just add calcium and you're done and it, it works. There's, there's a lot is associated with getting into the right part of the body and getting these things to work properly. Um, so the next problem is how do I get that nanoparticle to spit out its payload into the cells, into the right cells? And um, if you look at these little green balls here in the center of my slide, shows a kind of a contrast between what we call in this business um, fusogenic uh, uh, liposomes or lipids and non-fusogenic lipids. So typically how like doxorubicin and doxel, this nanoparticle we talked about at the beginning of my presentation, how that finds its way into a cell is via this process called endocytosis. Um, the nanoparticle gets taken up by the cell and put into a, a little packet of its own soap bubble called an endosome. Uh, this is usually a problem because that's the cell's own self-defense mechanism and it'll usually try to drop the pH and do other things to get rid of whatever payload gets taken up in that, endo in the, in that endosome because if it takes it up and it realizes it's a foreign object, it tries to get rid of it. And to actually avoid this endosomal uptake, especially when we're delivering a nucleic acid therapeutic. So how we did that is to look uh, at these, what are called fusogenic uh, coatings. And so the, the lipid, you play games with the chemistry. I showed you one example of lipid with a cationic head group. You can put a polyethylene glycol on that head group. You can put a lot of other things on the head groups and you can play games with the formulations. And, and if you do it, the, 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 the little lipid, instead of getting sucked into the cell via this endocytosis process, actually hits the cell wall and just fuses with it. It's called fusogenicity or fusogenic uh, liposomes. And they've been known for 20 years. In fact, one of the challenges people had with these things is they, whenever they hit a cell, they'd stick to any cell that they encountered and they were actually too fusogenic. So we, we had to, and I'm not gonna talk about it today, we had to play games with how you actually stabilize those, those uh, fusogenic systems to get them so that they don't fuse with any cell and only go after your target cell. Uh, but when they do that then, and they fuse, they spit out that payload and then now your payload is sitting inside the cell where it's supposed to be. Uh, the silicon nanoparticles, as you saw, when they don't have their little waxy coating around them, they dissolve, spit out their, nano, their uh, RNA, they, then they are actually very effective at, uh, at doing the, in, in that case, the gene silencing experiment that we were focusing on. So um, kind of a cartoon here shown on the right uh, gives uh, basically all of the little nano elements of some of the constructs that we've been working with. And, and now um, I'm going to take you in journey, uh, a tour of how we've used this type of formulation to treat a disease. Uh, and this is not coronavirus. We're going to be treating infections. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you a little bit how all of these uh, elements that I've talked about come to play. Uh, but there's one thing I've left out so far, and that's this thing that's the little red dots here uh, called the targeting peptide. And I have a very uh, close and dear collaborator named Erki Ruoslati who makes these peptide molecules that, that are basically like fishing lures for cells. They have a very strong affinity, or if he does it right, they have a very strong affinity for very specific cell types. 
And so he gives us these peptides that are basically the fishing lures for fish, the fish being the cells that we're going after, uh, and allows these nanoparticles to selectively bind to certain cell types and ignore other cell types, where then our little fusogenic uh, therapeutic can, can do its business. So there's three big elements there. The, the nanoparticle, it has our nucleic acid therapeutic sealed with that calcium silicate. We have to coat that with our fusogenic lipid, and then we put a targeting peptide on top of that. And so taking all of that together, I'm just going to, as I said, I'm just going to give you a quick vignette uh, journey into kind of one of the problems that, that, that we decided to go after. And this is, you know, a little bit as a lot of our work now is starting to pivot in a different direction, as you can imagine. Um, but here we were focusing on bacterial infections. Uh, and um, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, bacterial lung infection. Um, and uh, the little, this is uh, taken from a review article, what's going on here. So this is a little sick mouse with uh, uh, an, uh, a Staph aureus, a bacterial infection throughout his body. That's these little purple dots. Uh, let's just focus on the lungs. Uh, so these are the, these little purple dots are the bacterial infection. And there's a few other cells that are highlighted in this image. And those are very important cells because those are our immune cells, the lymphocytes, the neutrophils, and the macrophages that are going to go into the body and uh, basically uh, try to uh, deal with that infection and kill off those bacteria and, and heal the patient and heal, or heal the, the, uh, the, the, the animal. And I'm gonna focus on macrophages, because uh, we're going to be specifically targeting them. And this actually also has some very close relevance to the coronavirus. As most of you guys, oh, everybody who can't know now, uh, when people really catastrophically go off the deep end uh, with a coronavirus, it's because they have, they call it the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the cytokine storm, a massive inflammatory reaction to that virus in their lungs. Um, that basically they die from their, their own body's immune system overreacting to this infection. That's the same problem with bacterial infections, especially in the lungs. And so it's actually the same problem that we wanted to, with this system. And that was, we wanted to send something into the body to tell those macrophages, don't be so bad. Um, turn the macrophage, dial the macrophage response down a little bit. So again, what I'm showing here in the, in the, the bottom chart here is just an, an image that shows how, um, you know, kind of a, a, what we call a survival curve. If mice are infected with this in their lungs, uh, after a few days, uh, they all die away. So 100% survival means they're all alive. And by the time you get to zero, um, um, if you have a few left over at the end of the means they, their immune system has kicked in and they've survived that challenge. And what we wanted to do is figure out what it Zero mouse that allowed its immune system to respond, but not over respond to get it to be able to fight off that infection. Uh, in, in our approach, the focus was on dialing back that macrophage response, that highly inflammatory response of the macrophages. So fortunately, a lot of our work had been done for us. There had been groups well before us who had figured out the right type of gene that you could deliver to shut down the macrophage response. It's the genes called IRF5. We put in a silencing uh, sequence, uh, what's so-called siRNA, that will turn that gene off and shut down the macrophages, at least shuts down the inflammatory phase of the macrophages that causes this, basically these animals to die. Um, and then all the rest of this, or we have a targeting peptide that's gonna get us to the macrophages um, and ignore the other cell types in the lungs. Uh, we're going to coat it with our fusogenic liposome. So when it does find that cell, it's going to spit that nucleic acid payload into the cells, reprogram them, shut down the immune response. Um, we found this worked really well. Uh, and, uh, and there's some uh, cellular data here that uh, I just kind of briefly um, highlight because one of the real challenges we had to face in this is, is Okay, we knew from 20 years that people had made these fusogenic formulations that would hit a cell wall and, and fuse and, and, and spit out their payload. But we had to prove that they would only go to the macrophages and not to other cell types because that wasn't established yet. And we also had to know that with our nanoparticle construct, it was still gonna behave the same way that other fusogenic liposomal nanoparticles that didn't have a silicon core in them behaved. 
Uh, and so we did a lot of blocking study, kind of in, in, what are called inhibitor studies, where we, we, we tried to work out um, if we shut down uh, pathway for uh, endocytosis, um, do these particles still payload into the cell? So can we tell whether they're getting in via this endocytosis pathway or via this fusogenic? It, it turned out this was really important to us. Um, and what the data here shows is when we did these inhibitor studies, we found that actually we are uh, going in via a non-endocytosis pathway. It seems like these um, liposomes, these lipid coatings still behave properly and they fuse to our cells. And more importantly, they were using to the macrophiles, and that was because we had the right targeting peptide on the outside, these little red dots here. Okay. So kind of lot to swallow. Basically, we, 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 we convinced ourselves that the nanoparticles could bypass endocytosis, and they were, at least in a Petri dish, at silencing uh, the, the gene that we were going after. So they showed really high uh, efficacy in a Petri dish. So then we went to, an, to the animal model, and um, here's the data. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of my last uh, data slides here. Um, Starting out, again, this is a survive, um, and there's a few control experiments here. Um, the, the black dots in particular, PBS is a buffer solution. We just, it's a control experiment. You inject that uh, into the tail vein of the animals and it circulates, and then you watch how long it takes them to, and unfortunately this disease is very, very um, aggressive. Uh, this particular half aureus uh, disease model uh, kills these animals off very quickly. Uh, within four days, they were all dead in the control group. Um, and then we tried with non-fusogenic coatings and fusogenic coatings and different types of siRNA payloads, a uh, uh, control, a negative, and uh, found is, as we were hoping, um, we got this amazing response that when we put the, the green dots here is that construct that I talked about, the fusogenic uh, nanoparticle with all the right spinach inside and all the good in it, the siRNA against IRF5, and CRV is the targeting peptide that specifically goes after macrophages. And we inject the tail vein of the mice when they're just, on day zero, they get infected with the Staph aureus. On day one, we inject their tail vein with this drug. And then that, that nanoparticle goes through the body, it finds its way into the lungs, it selectively shuts down the macrophage response. And these animals actually all survived throughout the whole eight day period. And by then they're actually uh, respond uh, they're immune. They've basically recovered. Uh, we, we look in their lungs, there's no more bacterial infection. And so we've actually rescued those animals in that critical first few days period where that inflammatory response would normally just take them down. Um, we shut off that, or at least dialed that uh, inflammatory response sufficiently to where these animals could actually um, and then fight off the infection on their own. At the end of eight days, they were so kind of bottom line, we were able to use these nanoparticles to shut down that um, bacterial uh, response. And, and we showed that we could really significantly enhance the survival. What was amazing about this study, and we actually didn't, this was really a surprise to me because I was thinking this, we're going to kind of shut down the immune, you know, the, the, the inflammatory response. And then we'll probably have to give these animals some kind of antibiotic like vancomycin or something to, to just kill off the rest of the disease. We were really pleasantly surprised that just by shutting off that early phase immune response, uh, the animals will then mount a really effective uh, um, immune uh, response to basically fight off the infection and survive. So that, that was a great result for us and just about two years ago now. Um, so I just want to leave you with one last cartoon, which I've, I've alluded to in, in my present targeting groups. This is a video coming from my collaborator. Uh, Sangeeta Bhatia at MIT, who uh, Justin loaded this animation, um, showing a nanoparticle, uh, a targeting group, all the different cellular receptor pathways it has to go through to penetrate the right kind of cells, and, and then how it has to infiltrate the cell and deliver its payload specifically to the cell type that you're trying to do, trying to get at. And I hope I've been able to convince you through this talk that at least we're getting there. We're starting to get to a level of sophistication uh, that these systems are really starting to look like robots. 
going to be able to be programmed with the right kinds of to be able to get them to behave the way we need them to behave. And I take it, you know, the nanomedicine community take it as, as, as a great, uh, you know, uh, that, that we're seeing today, the, the fruits of the efforts that people made into the doxorubicin story 30 years ago to be able to get liposomes and lipid type materials uh, safe and effective enough to be used in humans, we could rapidly roll out virus vaccines. That's what we talked about earlier in, in our, in our uh, presentation. And I hope I gave you a little bit of a, 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 a insight problems that we work with here in our basic research lab to getting to the next generation of problems, making these systems even more related, um, than they currently are so they can be even more effective. And so I think one really the big takeaway is, you know, nanotechnology really does have a natural home in medicine. And I use natural kind of in a, in a, in a, in a, in a fashion trying to indicate that, um, you know, silicon itself is a natural material, even though uh, the wafers that we start with are very, very helpful. Um, and that uh, condensation chemistries are really important when we're talking about molecules that are highly charged or that need to be protected um, from, uh, you know, degradation in the body. And I hope I gave you a little bit of insight in the kind of challenges we have in trying to get part of the cell and this fusogenic story involved that. And, um, and the peptide targeting, which I really didn't do a lot of credit, give a lot of credit to it, but um, is really where this field is going now. We're, we're really able to develop and design molecules that are able to work in very good concert and synergy with our nanoparticles to be able to make everything more effective. Uh, and kind of just the, the highlight of, of the research out of our lab that I just kind of highlighted uh, for your present for this presentation is how we showed that we could use um, this this concept to uh, shut down a, a bacterial infection in a lung infection in, in mice. Um, with that, um, I'll just uh, thank uh, my collaborators. I mentioned already uh, Sangeeta Bhatia, uh, collaborator from MIT, who's uh, really uh, been a great dear friend of mine for many, many years, uh, working together for over now. Uh, she's the biologist. She's the real smart, kind of make the nanoparticles. And she says, here's our problem. And I'll say, well, maybe we can make something that works. And usually she does it better than I do. And Erky Roslati, another great collaborator, who's uh, the, the, the real brains behind designing uh, these uh, uh, peptide-based targeting groups. Those of you who are a little bit more in the nanomedicine field of RGD, uh, the Archive that's a uh, classic uh, integrin targeting peptide um, that Erky discovered back in the 80s. He's the one who discovered that peptide. And he's the one who's really led the whole field in using small peptides as targeting groups. And again, I didn't really have time to give justice to that. Uh, and the, the collaborators and coworkers here who have worked on a lot of this, uh, BJ Kim really deserves a shout out. And uh, she really developed uh, the, uh, the chemistry of uh, uh, these fusogenic systems and, and really had the insight to realize that putting a fusogenic coating on, on our nanoparticles was number one, stabilize them, and number two, much more effective. And Jin Young Kang, who uh, she uh, was really the one who developed the, the technology of this, this concrete chemistry that I talked about, the calcium silicon chemistry. And um, with that, I, I just have to say thank you, and I'll, I'll leave uh, uh, the things open for any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Um... So now we have time for the Q&A and uh, Zoom participants can raise their Zoom hand or type their questions in the Q&A panel, uh, call on them in turn to unmute their mic and ask their question. Uh, for those who don't want to uh, ask their question directly, put it in their, in their question in the Q&A panel and I will uh, read the question out loud. And for YouTube viewers, YouTube viewers can text questions in the YouTube chat box and uh, text questions from YouTube will, will be read out loud uh, for everyone to hear. So uh, we'll start with a question from Charles Clark. Charles, uh, can you unmute and ask your question? Oh, well, wonderful talk. And one thing that struck me, you know, it's the simple things that one understands early on and I didn't know, is how the silicon is sort of a miracle. It seems to be biologically innocuous, 
uh, and, and, and maybe it, it serves no discernible purpose, but it, it's very useful in packaging. And I was thinking that, you know, for example, you showed that silicon dioxide is evolved fairly naturally in within the body as a result of a chemical reaction. And you might say that's sort of like carbon monoxide. But if we think of something like silane, it's rather a, a, a very de deadly <laughs> compound that's often encountered in nanotechnology environments, whereas methane is, uh, well, we produce it every day under circumstances I won't go into in detail. So the, um, uh, I, I guess since silicon is so abundant in the Earth's crust, we wouldn't have evolved if it had a bad reaction. But I, I, I guess what I'm thinking is the analogies of carbon chemistry with silicon chemistry have a very limited applicability in understanding biological effects. So to answer your question, then, so silane is much more reactive than, than, than methane because the silicon has extra orbitals you can attach things to is kind of the chemical answer to your question. Um, but, you know, of course, silane is not what we're working with here. We're working with a material that's already been converted to silicon dioxide. And as you pointed yeah, out. Yes, yeah, so I guess you probably eliminated silane as the basic ingredient in biology. Yeah. So uh, just as a brief follow on, um, uh, and I'm sure you were part of this, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which I yep. think was started in the, I guess in the Clinton administration and, and yep. went, went on in, through the Bush and maybe even the Obama years, uh, huge, huge vehicle of investment. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a physical sciences person, so I've seen some yep. of the good outcomes there. Is there anything in biology or biomedicine that you can point to that was definitely advanced significantly. It, was there a highlight in nanomedicine that was associated with this national uh, bio, Oh, uh, yes. National nano oh, yes, most definitely. I mean, the, um, you know, we were beneficiaries of that in a, a, what was called a CCNE, a Cancer Center for Nanotechnology Excellence. It was stood up by the NIH. Uh, NSF also funded a lot of our work uh, that really got a lot of the concepts that we've been developing off the ground. Um, NIH made a critical investment in nanomedicine. They recognized already, because Doxel was already out there, uh, they recognized that, wow, there's, there's probably a much, this is a really critical pivot point for, for medicine. If we can just push this nanotechnology area a little bit more to get people to start thinking about other things besides treating cancer. Um, that was actually focused on cancer, that, that nanotechnology center of excellence. Uh, and that was because there really wasn't that many ideas or that many examples out there of nanomaterials that were used as medicines. And now, I mean, you see that that's why I, 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 I was being very facetious, but I, I, I titled my talk, you know, nanotechnology saves the world or the year that nanotechnology saves the world or, you know, because if, these vaccines roll out the level that we think they're going to be, you know, a huge fraction of the, of, of the population of the planet is going to have nanoparticles floating around in their bloodstream for some short period of time until, you know, those, those materials degrade quickly and, and deliver their vaccine and then they're gone. Um, but that's a, a, a milestone that, you know, 15 years ago when they stood those, those things up, uh, we never would have thought that you could get there. And so, yeah, I think our, our field in the sort of nanomedicine field has benefited tremendously from uh, the, the vision that, uh, that you know, the Clinton administration and the folks that, that started the nanotechnology initiative had, and we're still reaping the benefits from that. You know, I, I mentioned Shirley Mung uh, at the beginning of my talk, she's, she's using nanotechnology concepts that were developed under DOE sponsorship, Department of Energy sponsorship, to make better electrodes for rechargeable batteries. Uh, and those concepts also would not have happened without the huge investment that was made in nanotechnology about 10, 15 years ago. And, and, and it's really what's allowed the US to, to be at the level it is right now relative to the rest of the world in nanotechnology, right? my opinion. So we, we have another question from uh, Frederica Derema. Frederica, can you uh, unmute? And Charles, can you mute yes. yourself? Yes, 
Um, hi, Michael. And I very much enjoyed your talk. Uh, and I'm glad the previous question asked about nanotechnologies and NNI because I was involved at NSF at NNI and I believe we have met. Then I was the director of AFOSR and I, 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 I heard your work there also in terms of your recent project. So yep, yep. very, very I'm... good work. And I'm glad that the, all the basic research we have funded has been put now to, in a sense, attack the COVID problem. And uh, I was uh, thinking, uh, my question actually is, yes, uh, of course, in terms of the delivery of the vaccines, but uh, the work that you described made me think that, you know, when people uh, get COVID and uh, there are all these micro clouds that are creating, uh, created, and certainly while they are sick, you know, uh, accentuates the effects. But also there is now evidence that after people kind of quote, um, recover, there are still remaining effects. And so I was wondering if some of the work that you're doing could be applied to, in a sense, um, kind of uh, dilute or kill this uh, or dissolve this microclots uh, in lungs. Uh, you mentioned uh, other application that you mentioned also regarding the mouse experiments and also mm -hmm. um, other effects that I've heard is people losing their hearing and that might, because of microclots created mm -hmm. there and kind of, um, you know, stemming off oxygen delivery to the hair in the inner uh, ear. And so maybe that would be a way of uh, uh, kind of um, at least healing this kind of issues. Uh, so have you thought about that? That would be wonderful. Yeah, really good question. Uh, you know, administering, you know, anti-clotting agents or dealing with uh, the clotting cascade mm -hmm. is one of the areas that we started with uh, uh, back uh, actually in a totally different angle. Uh, Erky had these uh, uh, peptides, Erky Roselotti, my collaborator, had these peptides that would target clot, clotted proteins. And so uh, turns out that tumors tend to have, because they're leaky, they, they tend to have blood clots around them. And so that was kind of a mechanism we were using to not to turn off blood clots, but to use that as a targeting tool. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've, we've, we've looked at that. We have not looked at the specific question that you asked. We, we've not done any work in the shutting down clotting. There are groups out there that look at making nanoparticles that have mm -hmm. anti-clotting agents. I, I'm not actually sure uh, how far that has gone relative to the COVID problem. But yeah, that, that is a, a theme that's out there. So you're, you're right. And I just want to make one other comment because you were at o o AFOSR and I benefited from an AFOSR program uh, also many years ago. It was focused on nano sensing. Yes. And it's a great example of how you know, a lot of the technologies that we developed for our nanomedicine stuff actually were developed in that program. And AFOSR can't, and they won't maybe take credit for it. They should, because this is the nature of basic research. You know, uh, They funded some ideas that, okay, and we did make some sensors and they were really useful and we thought they worked well and we, we were we had some, we wrote some nice papers on those, but they also took our research in a lot of different directions as well, and that's the thing that's really missed very often is that these investments in basic research, yeah, we have this target, we 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 kind of go after it, but you know, scientists we're we're really, you know, sometimes uh, we really follow our noses, and and sometimes we're 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 thinking about areas and applications in totally orthogonal directions. And the beauty of, of the, the US science funding uh, infrastructure, at least for the most part of my career, has been that these agencies realize that scientists need to follow their noses. And yeah, there's lots of eurekas that occur when you don't expect them. And funding that basic research really, really enables a lot of those kinds of eurekas. So. You're here. Glad, glad to hear that. And uh, I still interact with people at UCSD, Amit Mazunder at the San Diego Supercomputing Center. And when COVID kind of subsides, I'm supposed to come and visit. So I'll look you up. Oh, and, yeah, well, you definitely. Know, you know, our, our... pursuing some of this work, you know, regarding the clothing, because yeah. I think it is recognized as a big issue at this point as a relic of COVID. Yeah. So sure, definitely stop um, by. I mean, we have, uh, you know, Todd Pascal and it's highly connected with our center into the, yeah. the, the, the cancer or into the uh, comp super computing yeah. facility. So we have very strong connections with that. And that's one of the really neat things about computational chemistry now is it's, it's at the stage now where we can actually mm -hmm. use it to design nanomaterials. Great. Much more effectively. 
I have a text question from, yep. uh, from Tim Thomas. Dorema, can you mute yourself, please? Uh, Tim wants to know, is there a targeting peptide on the COVID RNA nanoparticle? And if so, what does it target? Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, let me just state from the get-go that, that I am not privy to any of their proprietary information. So uh, there may be something there that does have some selectivity to it. Uh, all I've heard is that they are not specifically targeting. And keep in mind for the, a, a vaccine, you know, there, it's an intramuscular injection. That nanoparticle doesn't have to go very far. It's just got to get into a cell wherever in the muscles, muscle tissue that you're injecting. Uh, so it doesn't have to nearly the, the tortuous path that, that the nanoparticles that I talked about have to take. Um, it's just got to move a little bit, get into the right cells and, and, and elicit the response and you know, generate the, the, so I would, my guess would probably be that they don't really have any specific targeting, but I, again, I don't want to speak to something that I'm not, uh, I'm really not confident to, to answer that question. So I have a question from, from Carl Merrill, um, NIH emeritus scientist and person who likes to do quantum double slit experiments in his basement. So Carl. Ah, thank you. That was, I, I really enjoyed your talk. It raised uh, one major question, and that is, I've been using bacterial viruses to treat infections, which are, in, its, in essence, nanoparticles. And of course, yeah. when you give them to an animal or a person, most of them end up in the liver. Um, yeah. So only some, because you have the innate immune system. So, and I noticed in some of your slides, you, you actually injected into the tail vein. So it's going into the blood. So it's going to go through the liver. So the, I, I wondered whether, any, if, whether you've looked at the liver for any lesions from the silicon. And the reason I'm raising that is because I'm a physician and I was aware of a, a disease called silicosis. Yeah. Which results in yeah. 43,000 deaths per year globally. Yeah. Uh, so... I wondered if you'd comment on that, and also whether you've looked at, for lesions in the in the uh, in the in the uh, liver. Yeah, to answer your question, yes, we have looked for that, and not in the liver. We've never seen any issues. But and, and you you hit on a really important point, and it's often glossed over by a lot of us, kind of trying to sell our technologies. Um, and a lot of us are guilty of this: is that you know there's always problems, right? Um, so silicon, yes, I, I, I made the case that it's very low toxicity. The body knows how to handle it. We Early days, we were first doing some experiments uh, with uh, Steve Howell, who's a cancer doc here at our place, and he wanted to do ovarian cancer. So we, we said, well, let's just see how much we can put into a mouse. And so uh, he really wanted to load up uh, the uh, peritoneal cavity with a, a therapeutic um, you know, they typically, they, they can put a liter of, of cisplatin into a, a woman's uh, uh, peritoneal cavity if she's got ovarian cancer. Uh, and so, he, so we, we put in a lot of nanoparticles and we saw massive renal failure. Uh, so you talk about silicosis. So what was happening there was the particles, we put so many particles in there that they dissolved, uh, created the silicic acid and it re-precipitated in the kidneys, in the, in the cells in the kidneys and basically uh, started shutting down the kidneys. So, you know, that clearly set an upper bound for us, uh, you know, and, 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 and how you would really, where you could deploy this technology, you can't put in a bucket load of this material. Uh, fortunately for nucleic acid therapeutics, they're so potent that we're putting in levels that are very, very low relative to the baseline level of silicon uh, in the bloodstream already. But it still is a concern and it's an issue and that's something we look for. But no, we haven't seen any, uh, you know, occasionally we'll see, uh, you know, the pickup in the Kupfer cells and sometimes we'll see some uh, early, uh, uh, early indications of cells, uh, of particles in the cells that seem to resolve. Uh, so not any of the longer term, and what I mean long term is, you know, maybe a week or two at most for us, uh, by then the particles are gone. Uh, any of those kind of time scales, we've, we've not really seen uh, any dramatic problems, but typically we're doing an injection is kind of a milligram per kilogram of body weight. So a very low level injection. And, and the other thing is your experiments are acute experiments, whereas these lesions in, in the humans uh, occur over a period of time. So yeah. you might not see them in-, in No, in... you're right. And you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big concern. You know, I, I left the slide out, but uh, one of my highlights in the dissolution side of the story was 
a picture of asbestos. You know, asbestos is an aluminosilicate. You breathe in asbestos fibers and you, know, you get mesothelioma. You guys have all seen the videos, uh, the co commercials. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, the, uh, you know, those fibers are silicon, oxygen, and aluminum, but they're thermally very, very stable and they don't dissolve. So they, patients will breathe in asbestos fibers and they'll be in their lungs 10 years later. So this is a big issue. And that's why our mantra in our lab is we have to engineer these materials so they dissolve. They, they cannot be as stable as something like asbestos. And that's the goal for that is to try to minimize the possibility that they're gonna stay around for any length of time. But you do bring up a really important point and you know, that's basic research. We definitely have to do a lot more work in these areas. That's why I, I tried to highlight the liposome story at the beginning because that, that's a good example of where we really did take, we meaning the community, uh, took uh, a nanoparticle from very early stage and, and did all of our homework and, and, and have a lot more experience with the material to know that it's, it's safe. That still has to be done with silicon, quite frankly. Thank you. So a couple of questions. One is, could you talk a little bit about scale up issues and quality control issues for these? Yeah. So, um, okay, so first off, one of my disclosures was I'm a consultant for a company called TrueTag. Uh, they have a capability, they have a GMP facility uh, out in Hawaii right now that can do about a kilogram of porous silicon a day, uh, which is more than we would need for a long, long time for any kind of our therapeutics, you know, milligram per kilogram body weight kind of injections, you're not looking at a lot of material per, per dose. Um, so we've been working closely with them. I helped translate the technology to them uh, many years ago. They're developing it for their own uh, applications I won't get into. Uh, but uh, so yes, we have that technology has been scaled uh, to a level, certainly for nanomedicine, uh, that would be appropriate. Um, whether it's useful, whether it be what it would work, is still open questions. But I'm not too concerned about the scaling issue for that. You don't have questions of the liposomes fusing and oh. various dispersion of the sizes and the- Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. That, yeah, very, they're very good point. I mean, you know, so you talk about the cold chain for the coronavirus vaccines, you know, why do we need to keep these things so cold? Okay, they, they claim that RNA is very unstable, but come on, you know, the lipid, materials they're putting around these nanoparticles probably is why they go to so just cold temperatures because liposomes generally are not very stable. They're using lipid nanoparticles, which are a little bit more stable. What we found is putting these lipids around the solid core silicon nanoparticle made them a lot more stable. Uh, they still will aggregate. We have problems with aggregation. A lot of times when students are first getting trained on this thing, we'll see a lot of aggregation in their procedures. Uh, so that aggregation of uh, the nanoparticles is, a, is often a huge problem. Uh, kind of the trick for the way you get around that is you put enough charge on that particle, not so much that the immune system recognizes it, but enough charge on it so the particles don't just flocculate and accumulate in, in the bottom of your beaker. So another question, question. is, um, if you, you really, you know, one RNA in a cell can make a lot of, a fair amount of protein. And if the protein is presented, that it can stimulate the immune system and then the immune system will amplify its response. But you were talking about packing a lot of R RNA. In your case, it was, I guess, siRNA or RNAi. Yep. But for the mRNA vaccines, how much RNA do you really need? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, and how much dose do you need to put in? Um, all I can say is that generally, the more efficient your nanoparticle is, the more payload it can carry, the, the, the more potent it tends to be. Uh, there probably is an upper limit to where you just don't need to pack it that much, but we haven't seen that yet. We found that when we do our experiments, we're always trying to minimize the dose, right? So we wanna keep, for the questions that came up earlier, we wanna keep our dose as low as possible and deliver as much payload therapeutic as possible. Um, but yeah, th this, one of the advantages we have working with nucleic acid types of therapeutics is they're so potent uh, that you don't need a whole lot to start, in the case of a vaccine, to start training the immune system. Uh, in the case of a siRNA, same thing, you know, you're, you're, uh, these things are so potent that the amount you need to deliver is, is fairly low. So one, one last question is, uh, which cells 
does the mRNA have to get into? Which, which ones result in the most potent response? I mean, there's uh, a bunch of immune cells and inflammatory yeah, immune cells good, floating around, good. but which ones really count? Yeah, good question. Well, you know, to activate the immune system, uh, you have to get to the immune cells. Uh, the, um, you know, there's different types of vaccines, some that are more activating, uh, you know, the, the killer T cells, some that are, ultimately what you're trying to do is get, turn on the, 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 the body's ability, the, the cells' abilities to, to make antibodies. Um, I really can't talk to what, these coronavirus vaccines are, are focusing on or what cell types they're, or what their distribution is among cells. Uh, I think the general uh, concept there is if you deliver mRNA to any cell and it generates protein, if it, its cellular machinery kicks in and it generates a protein, that protein makes it to the surface in the form of the spike protein of that cell, then, then the immune system will, will find it and recognize it. Uh, and so even like muscle cells and where they're in injecting them. But I, I really am not competent to talk to how those COVID vaccines are being deployed and, 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 and their, their, their distribution among different cell types. It's, that's not my area. Uh, maybe another talk. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much, Michael, for spending the time with us and sharing this uh, interesting research that you're doing and, and uh, giving us some insight into how these vaccines work and what's in store for the future using uh, nanoparticles and nanotechnology to, uh, to deal with health issues and improve our health. Thank so you. A I joy to have you here and, and thanks so much. No, oh, yeah, it was great to share the, the evening with you. Thank you. The next lecture will be in two weeks on January 22, 2021. The speaker will be Allison Hill, assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. She will be speaking on a somewhat related topic, the mathematics of epidemics and its use in modeling pandemic and epidemic disease spread. And on January 5th, Avi Loeb, distinguished professor at Harvard University, will be speaking to us on the search for life and the likelihood of extraterrestrials, including ones smarter than we are. Check often for updates to the schedule as we build out the spring lecture series. And with that, Let's thank tonight's crew, James, Ann, and Robin, for producing tonight's meeting and lecture. Thank you all. And with that, I will now adjourn the 2,432nd meeting of the Society. I wish everyone a good evening. I wish everyone a happy new year. And I wish everyone a very, very good 2021. The meeting is adjourned.